and you can see as people are logging on. Excellent. Hi everyone, we'll get started in just a minute. All right. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Division of Rheumatology Grand Rounds. Thank you for joining us. Um, just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, you, Dr. Kallenberg will save a few, about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of her lecture for questions. So um, feel free to chat any questions that you have into the Q&A box. Um, as opposed to the chat box, we would appreciate if you could put them all in the Q&A box so they're consolidated there. Um, and if at the end of the lecture, if anyone would like to use their camera or audio to speak, you can just raise your hand and I'm happy to upgrade you so you're able to ask your question that way. And now I, oh, also this will be recorded and posted on our website later this week. So now I will pass things off to Dr. Christian Lude. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Kallenberg. Though I doubt that she needs much introduction to this audience. Um, Dr. Kallenberg completed her MD and PhD at um, Case Western, Ohio, and then studying among others cast phase one in monocytes and an area of research she has continued to be interested in. She then moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, both for a fellowship and then continued there and is now an associate professor at U Michigan as well as associate chief of basic and translational research. She's well recognized for her many groundbreaking observations in lupus and has been awarded among others the Edmund L. Dubois Award as well as the Mary Betty, Betty Stevens Award for her many significant contributions to lupus research. Uh, Dr. Kallenberg has also made several key observations regarding inflammasome and interferon biology, some of which I hope she will be sharing with us today. And so with that, I would like to welcome Dr. Kallenberg to present on her work on normal and not normal. Thank you, Christian. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I see a lot of familiar names in the list. I'm looking forward to talking with some of you later today. Um, so yeah, so I would like to tell you a story about when normal isn't normal and some of the, the knowledge that we have learned about uh, the skin of lupus patients. Um, here are my disclosures and here's some references if anyone would like to read about things further after, uh, after the talk. So I don't need to tell you uh, how important uh, systemic lupus is, but um, for, for the sake of general introduction, uh, lupus is an autoimmune disorder that affects you know, many different organ systems. And we know that it's driven by a combination of genetic susceptibilities and environmental triggers. Um, and these drive enhanced innate immune responses and autoreactive TMV cell activation. And really, I feel like lupus has become an intense area of research to improve uh, treatment options for patients. And it's been a lot of fun to be in this field for the last 10 years to see all of the um, progress that has been made. Um, one of the things we know as rheumatologists is that the skin is very frequently affected in lupus patients. And these are all my patients here um, who have come to me with refractory uh, skin disease. And I think one of the, the reasons it's important to focus on skin disease uh, in terms of research and also trying to improve our clinical care is that not only do a lot of patients have uh, skin disease as part of their lupus, um, but it, ha it, is, you know, it can be a very refractory uh, organ in terms of treating these patients. We can treat their nephritis and get the rest of their lupus quiet, but the skin can often be uh, resistant um, to our usual lupus therapies. Um, we also know that there's this link between skin inflammation and systemic disease and that exposures like UV light to the skin can lead to systemic flares in patients. And we don't have any FDA approved therapies specifically for the cutaneous manifestations of lupus. So really when patients have refractory disease, we're sort of left with a, a, a black box of things to try. Um, cutaneous lupus flares are also really important contributors to a low quality of life for patients. Um, they raise the rate of unemployment for patients and they can double the cost of healthcare uh, for, for our lupus patients. Um, and when we think about cutaneous lupus, there's different types that we think about. There's acute cutaneous lupus, which is the malar rash typically, although you can get a more widespread form of acute cutaneous lupus. And this, this type of lupus rash is most often associated with, with systemic disease activity. There's also subacute cutaneous lupus, which tend to be these targetoid type lesions, although you can have a more papular form. They tend to involve the trunk most commonly, 
Um, and these also have um, sort of like between acute and discoid in terms of their association with systemic uh, disease. And then there's discoid lesions, which are often the most disfiguring. They do scar and cause a lot of pigmentation um, uh, abnormalities in patients. Um, and they're, they're really devastating because they tend to occur most frequently on the head and scalp or the scalp and the face. And so, um, you know, it's really hard for patients when these are the things that people are seeing. Um, uh, and discoid uh, lesions have the lowest um, association with, with systemic uh, disease activity. And one of the things that all of these lesions have in common is uh, photosensitivity and that the sun uh, can bring out uh, flares of these lesions in patients. Um, and uh, I'd given this talk recently to um, uh, the Harvard group and George Sokos had informed me that he was actually the one that submitted this photosensitivity picture to the ACR image bank. So that was kind of a cool piece of trivia. Um, in addition to having cutaneous lupus associated with um, systemic disease, we can also have cutaneous lupus um, that does not have systemic disease associated with it. And it's not been until recently that we've understood, you know, some of the epidemiology of, of CL, isolated CLE. Um, previously, it had been reported that the frequency of isolated CLE was about as common as what we saw for systemic lupus. So you could have systemic lupus or isolated CLE, and, and the two occurred with about the same frequency. But this was really from a, a predominantly Caucasian population as the study was done at Mayo. Uh, more recently, there's been um, some multi-ethnic cohorts, which, which suggests that in, in Black patients, especially the incidence of cutaneous lupus, especially discoid, is four to five times higher than in Caucasian patients. So when you consider that um, and the fact that you have about an equal frequency of um, CLE and SLE in, in white patients, we really can, can start to think about that CLE really affects a much more substantial percent of the population than we may have previously thought. And when we think about isolated CLE versus systemic, one of the things that got me into this um, field, one of the first research questions I had was, was there differences between these two types of skin lesions? And I can tell you that at least at a transcriptional level, we haven't been able to find any distinguishing uh, biomarkers that really identify a CLE, isolated CLE versus a systemic uh, CLE lesion. And this is just data from one of our papers a few years ago that looked at interferon scores in um, either discoid or SCLE, either from isolated patients that didn't have systemic lupus or patients with systemic lupus. And you can see the interferon scores were pretty well matched across the subcategory. So we haven't been able to identify um, any distinguishing features uh, otherwise. So as far as we know, molecularly, um, these lesions are uh, have the same pathogenic pathways turned on. Um, so when we think about what causes cutaneous lupus, um, there has been some uh, recent mouse models which have been somewhat informative in terms of understanding um, pathways that, that might be relevant or important. Um, and Marshak's Rostein group had this nice uh, paper in JCI a few years ago uh, in which they took mice that were deficient in TLR9 and overexpressed uh, ovalbumin in the keratinocytes of these mice. And then they uh, had a model where they would gamma irradiate the mice and then do an adoptive transfer of ovospecific T cells into these mice. And what they found was you could get a cutaneous lupus like lesion. The development of it was fast dependent. Um, and it also was dependent on the type 1 interferon receptor. And so here they, they treated mice with a neutralizing antibody to the type 1 interferon receptor or to isotype control. And you can see that the mice that got the, the blockade um, did not develop the cutaneous uh, lesions, whereas the mice that got isotype did, suggesting that you do need this interferon induction, this type 1 interferon induction, in order to get these lupus-like rashes. In addition, there's also recently been reports of a uh, knockout mouse of PD-1H, which is also known as VISTA. And here, this is an inhibitory receptor on T cells or an inhibitory ligand on uh, myeloid cells. And, and you put this knockout onto the BALB-C background, about 36% of the mice get discoid lesions. And these mice uh, in, their, in their lesions show a interferon signature and also a more robust interferon signaling after R848 treatment. Um, and um, they also noted that there was increased plasma cytoid dendritic cells and neutrophils in the skin of these mice prior to um, the onset of the lesion development, suggesting that early recruitment into the skin of these uh, inflammatory cell populations might be important in triggering disease. Um, we also know that um, uh, 
uh, oxidized DNA, which occurs after exposure to UV light. Um, if you inject this into the skin of mice, it can, it can trigger a cutaneous lupus-like reaction in, in MRL LPR lupus prone mice. Um, and this was also correlated with increased interferon production from plasmacytes with dendritic cells. And recently there was actually an interesting uh, model um, in mice that are deficient in the enzyme that repairs the 8-hydroxyguanosine adduct that occurs on DNA after UV exposure. These mice, if you give them pristine to sort of trigger a lupus-like environment, um, develop alopecia and uh, cutaneous immune complexes and epidermal hyperplasia. Um, and, and this is what the, the mice look like here. Um, so, and this also showed an increased interferon signature in the skin. So if we can't repair the DNA damage, um, this possibly could also be triggering interferon signaling and, um, and induction of cutaneous lupus. So the common theme really with all of these mouse models that has um, emerged is that type one interferons seem to be, if not required, at least turned on in, um, in all of these models of cutaneous lupus. And there's some here that I didn't show you, such as the VGL3 over expressor mouse, um, which we developed with, with one of my colleagues here, um, that also has a high type 1 interferon signature as well. So, so we think that they're relevant and important in cutaneous lupus. And we know that human CLE lesions have high interferon signatures. So this is um, data where we had used these particular genes to calculate an interferon score in um, lesional biopsies from either discoid or subacute and just calculated the interferon scores um, in these lesions. And what you could see is basically every single lesion had um, had an elevated interferon score. And this is different from what we see in systemic lupus patients, where 60% or so of systemic lupus patients, if you look peripherally in the blood, you see an interferon signature. But here in the skin lesions, you see 100% of them have an elevated interferon signature, suggesting that interferons may be more prominent in the skin than even in the systemic disease manifest lesions. Um, the other interesting thing um, that I want to just go back and highlight is this connection between epidermal inflammation and systemic disease. So this is an old paper from 1985 where they had taken different types of lupus prone mice and exposed them to one dose of 500 millijoules per centimeter squared of UVB. And then looked to see what happened in these mice. And what they saw was that the male mice um, in the BXSB background, which have the extra copy of TLR7, um, these mice rapidly died after this single UV exposure. And they, they were able to see an increase in the, the glomerular inflammation uh, in these mice. And um, you could see the development of crescents as well um, in the glomeruli of these mice, suggesting that there's communication between the skin and the, um, the development of GN. Um, we had shown a couple of years ago that we could replicate this in uh, the NZM2328 mice simply by injuring the epidermis with tape stripping. So this is a very glamorous uh, experiment where you take duct tape and you put it on the back of a shaved mouse and you take it off and you just keep repeating it until they get a Band-Aid kind of rash. Um, and then we see what happened. And we could see in this mouse background as well, we could have the same um, uh, accelerated development of, um, of nephritis in these mice. Um, and uh, we could see uh, increased immune complexes in the skin as early as 14 days after this uh, epidermal um, tape stripping. And um, we, we saw that the primary cell population coming in early, at least at the days that we looked, was um, the CD11 C positive Lysix C high um, dendritic cell population. Um, so again, connecting the skin and the kidney. And I don't need to tell anybody here about um, the data coming out of Keith Elkin's lab. Um, as well, where now um, they have characterized that the neutrophils actually seem to be really important in this communication piece, um, where you can see an influx of neutrophils into the kidney as early as one day after a, a single dose of UV to the, the skin of these mice. And um, if you inhibit neutrophils, um, you can block the upregulation of the interferon genes in the kidneys of these mice. And uh, which I think is in this uh, last experiment here, which I think is quite beautiful, um, where they were able to label the neutrophils as they traveled through the skin of these mice and um, then detect these GFP positive neutrophils in the kidney after 
cutaneous UV exposure. Again, suggesting that the migratory neutrophils coming to the skin very quickly after UV are showing up in the kidney. So again, connecting the two um, uh, pieces together of how the skin and the kidney um, could potentially be communicating in lupus. Um, and my question for Keith is, you know, what happens in lupus prone mice with this particular experiment? And I'm sure he's working on that. Um, so, you know, so we know that the interferons are high, that they're involved, um, and that there's this connection between what happens in the skin and what happens in the rest of the body in, in, in lupus. So one of the questions that I have been interested in for the past several years is whether there is something different about lupus skin, even normal looking lupus skin, that primes for inflammation. And the short answer is yes, there is. So if, if you feel the need to take a nap, I've told you the conclusion of the rest of the talk, but I'll go into more specifics now if you want to stay tuned in. Um, so we have been focused on the epidermis. And I think, you know, just a baseline um, orientation in case you don't think about the skin regularly, the epidermis is, you know, this layer of keratinocytes, the basal layer is the self-regenerating layer, um, which then as they progress uh, towards the surface of the skin, um, undergo this step-by-step -step differentiation process into the spinosis and then the granulosum layer. Um, and so uh, just so you have some anatomy, because I'm gonna talk about some of these subgroupings of the keratinocytes uh, as we go through. Um, and one thing about keratinocytes, um, which is that they're really poised to communicate with other cell populations. So you have to imagine something that's sitting at the interface of you know, environmental toxins, UV light, the microbiome, uh, you know, it, the keratinocytes are really sensing and, and interpreting, you know, tons of signals all the time coming in through the skin. And they have a really large repertoire of the different types of cytokines and chemokines they can make. Uh, this data here is from a review that we uh, wrote with Johan Johnson's uh, lab in JCI Insight a couple uh, months ago. And um, basically showing here is, is some RNA-seq data that we've helped generate um, where we treated keratinocytes with these different triggers and then looked at all the different responses. And you can see there's quite a few chemokines and, and uh, cytokines that keratinocytes make um, in order to you know, respond to these particular triggers. So a few years ago, the AMP project had looked at some non-lesional skin biopsies in lupus nephritis patients, and they had seen this interesting chronic uh, interferon signature that was uh, in the um, keratinocytes from these lupus nephritis uh, patients. And um, we have uh, since collected our own single cell data from lupus skin, and we can also identify um, this same you know, chronic interferon signature in lupus patients. We see it most prominently, this is both non-lesional in the green and lesional skin in the blue, and we also have healthy control uh, keratinocytes in this uh, UMAP. Um, and you can see that there's this subgroup of basal or keratinocytes, which is predominantly from both non-lesional and lesional keratinocytes that really have a high uh, expression level of these interferon-stimulated genes. In the spinous layer, which is the layer directly above the basal keratinocytes, we also see that um, uh, in the lesional more than the non-lesional actually, that there's also um, some stressed uh, signaling going on, but also a high interferon uh, signature as well. So, so again, we in vivo, you know, taking these out and directly looking at them through single cell RNA sequencing, we can see this same uh, interferon priming in both lesional and non-lesional skin. And we think one of the reasons why the interferon signaling is high in, in uh, the lupus patients is because they chronically overproduce a type one interferon called interferon kappa. So um, these are Western blots from our, our keratinocyte cultures, either from healthy controls or, or lupus patients. And we can see an increase in interferon kappa protein. Um, and uh, this correlates with uh, increased chronic activation of phosphostat one and phosphostat two, suggesting that there's an autologous loop going on in these patients. Um, and if we treat lupus keratinocytes with triggers like peptidoglycan or UV, we can see an increased secretion of uh, interferon kappa into the supernatant as measured by ELISA. So suggesting this is a functional um, and, and uh, autocrine signaling pathway. Um, interestingly, um, Ed Vitale's group recently um, published another paper which um, also helped to confirm some of our initial observations where here they looked, and this is RNA scope, so it's really hard to see, but I promise it's there. Um, they looked at interferon kappa expression in, um, in uh, uh, lupus skin after UV exposure, and you can see that there's an increase in the interferon kappa uh, expression um, in vivo in, in uh, these patients. And they also actually had a really interesting um, angle in which they had a lot of patients in their cohorts 
that were at risk. So they were ANA positive patients that didn't have any systemic autoimmune disease. So these were either relatives or other patients that had been referred in for a positive ANA, but they hadn't developed really any manifestations. And what they found was there was, um, you know, kind of a gradient in how much interferon kappa the skin was making, where this is a lupus patients here, where you can see um, the interferon kappa again in the red, predominantly in the epidermis. Um, they also have interferon alpha in green, which you can't really see much of. Um, and then they kind of scored these, um, the interferon scores in the expression data from the skin of the um, lupus patients. And you can see um, that uh, the lupus patients have sort of the highest um, interferon expression, whereas the at risk, which is kind of shown in this middle, um, is uh, sort of in between like full-fledged lupus and healthy control. So even in patients who are ANA positive without systemic autoimmune disease, they seem to have this higher interferon signature in their non-lesional skin. Um, and the other thing that's interesting is this comparison that they made here, where you look at the interferon signature in the blood of patients versus the, the same non-lesional skin biopsies from the lupus patients. And the interferon signature is way higher in the skin than in the blood. And again, this goes with the lesional data that I showed you before, where the interferon signature is very consistent in the lesions, um, whereas we know in about 40% of lupus patients, you don't detect a circulating interferon signature um, compared to healthy control. So again, suggesting that the skin might be a special environment um, uh, as compared to the blood. Um, and you know, just so that you know, we, we don't only focus on interferons. Um, we have looked in our single cell data and in the keratinocytes to see what other cytokines may be signaling um, chronically in the skin. And so this is, we basically have created scores um, by treating healthy control keratinocytes with different cytokines. So here we developed a signature for either TNF treated keratinocytes or IL-17 alpha or A treated keratinocytes or interferon alpha treated keratinocytes, and then created a score as to what genes get turned on when these cytokines are stimulated, and then applied that score to the expression that we saw in our single cell data in the different keratinocyte subcompartments. And you can see again, not surprisingly, that uh, the blue is lesional and the green is non-lesional that we see in the basal cells in particular, this robust upregulation of the interferon score in lesional and non-lesional skin. Um, but we also see a hint of um, IL-17 signaling, um, not so much in the basal, but in some of the, the upper layers of the keratinocytes um, in the spinous and supraspinous. Um, and we also see some TNF signaling in the basal cells in both lesional and non-lesional skin. So again, suggesting interferons aren't the only thing that's happening in the skin, but definitely is a predominant feature. Um, and the other thing that we know is that the keratinocytes are in, in lupus skin are really talking to other cell populations and it's not just an autocrine loop to itself. So this is a circos plot um, from our single cell data where we looked at genes that are specifically upregulated in lupus keratinocytes versus healthy control keratinocytes and then mapped out um, those genes that are being expressed in the keratinocytes unique to lupus or at least to above the cutoff full change cutoff uh, for lupus, and then what cell populations would they be talking to in the skin? So in our single cell data, these other cell populations have to express the receptor for whatever the keratinocytes are making. And you can see that the keratinocytes in lupus have a pretty robust crosstalk with fibroblasts, uh, with endothelial cells, and with myeloid cells um, that have been recruited into the skin. We see less crosstalk with T cells, um, melanocytes or smooth muscle cells. Um, so really suggesting myeloid populations as well as the other cell populations in the skin may be sort of the main cross communicators with the keratinocytes um, in lupus. The other thing that we know about um, lupus keratinocytes is their, their responses to various triggers is not normal either. So this is a study that we did where we looked at non-lesional keratinocytes from healthy control or lupus patients, and we just stimulated them with either type 1 alpha or type 1 beta or uh, interferon gamma, and then just did RNA-seq of their responses. And one of the things you can see on the top is the lupus keratinocytes, and on the bottom is healthy controls. In the lupus keratinocytes, the response to these different interferons is just much more robust. Um, and we were able to identify with the help of Alex Soy, who's the first author on this paper, a um, subset of these genes that seem to have a specific, um, more robust uh, 
uh, upregulation in response to interferons. We call these the lupus sensitive interferon genes. There's about 100 of them that really have a much more robust um, response after being uh, triggered with any of these um, type 1 interferons. Um, so we know that more interferons are made and that keratinocytes are seeing these interferons in vivo and that um, they have a much more robust response when the interferons are there in the lupus keratinocytes versus controls. Um, we also know there's other sources of interferons besides just the keratinocytes themselves. And so, you know, plasmacytoid dendritic cells have been described in, in lupus skin. We know based on some older photo testing work that they get recruited to lupus skin, um, at least by doing immunohistochemistry at a greater rate um, after UV than in healthy controls. And we know that PDCs make type 1 interferons. Uh, one of the triggers is thought to be immune complexes stimulating TLR7 and 9. Um, and, and we know again that they're there after UV. Um, and there has been data to show that blockade of PDCs um, can, can decrease the interferon signature in lesional skin. So there's this lovely phase two uh, trial using an antibody that downregulates activation of PDCs. Um, and it shows that the, the MX1 gene signature goes down, or I guess it was the protein staining in the lesions go down. Um, and that correlated with classy response in those patients. Um, Interestingly, Ed Vital's group has also um, recently shown that at least in lesional uh, skin, they're finding a more exhausted phenotype in the, um, in the lupus patients in their PDCs. And they showed that TNF-alpha can also um, be inhibiting the interferon production from these PDCs and possibly um, changing their function to promote uh, maturation and antigen present presentation instead of just type 1 interferon production. So I think you know we don't fully understand the PDCs in lupus and, and what exactly they're doing. I think one hypothesis that's out there is that the PDCs get recruited into non-lesional skin. And then in that microenvironment, they switch from being interferon producers to possibly antigen presenting cells. Um, and it may be, we don't fully understand that microenvironment, but depending on when you catch those PDCs in the skin, their phenotype may be different. Um, monocytes also are important, um, and uh, at least Keith's you know, shown some really nice data uh, that um, wild type mice definitely have an inflammatory monocyte recruitment into the skin, um, and that they are important producers of type 1 interferons as well. And then LDGs are these low density granulocytes are also um, you know, makers of type 1 interferon and have been reported to be found in at least lesional skin of lupus patients. And again, I think with the neutrophil data um, that Keith's group has put out, uh, sort of what the role of LDGs are in lupus, um, you know, in, in their recruitment into the skin after UV is an important question. Um, so, you know, we see that the interferons are there. And I think, you know, beyond them just being described as high, I think the next important question is really what are the fu functional consequences of having these increased interferons in um, non-lesional lupus skin. And so I just summarized here um, data that uh, we know so far, this is a lot of work, um, mostly from my lab, but also from Teresa Liu's group, um, looking at what, what does it mean if you have high interferons in the skin? Um, and we've shown that you can take supernatants from lupus keratinocytes and put them on dendritic cells. And you can activate those dendritic cells in a, in a interferon dependent manner. So you can block it with um, baricitinib, which inhibits JAK1. So we think that having too many interferons can be modulating dendritic cell phenotypes. Um, we've shown that you get enhanced um, IL-6 production with these high interferons um, in lupus skin. Um, we also uh, recently published that you can actually um, disrupt some of the barrier gene synthesis in the skin with um, type 1 interferon priming. And we think this might be leading to increased colonization of lupus lesions by Staph aureus. Um, and Teresa Lewis group has shown that Langerhans cells are depleted in, in uh, lupus skin, and, and some of her more recent abstract data suggested this could also be um, dependent on type 1 interferons. Um, and then we also uh, have published that the type 1 interferons are required for um, repression of Treg development after UV exposure. And so you, in lupus prone mice, you get this robust upregulation of T cells uh, proliferation and activation in the draining lymph nodes from the skin. 
um, and you, you do not turn on a Treg response, whereas in um, the same lupus prone mice with a deletion of the type 1 interferon receptor, you actually restore Treg upregulation and suppressive effects of the Tregs, um, and you do not get a activated T cell response after UV exposure. So again, the interferons are also um, changing how the T cells become activated uh, after UV. And maybe one of the reasons why you lose the suppressive effects of UV uh, on the skin, because normally UV is thought to be an immunosuppressive thing. We use it to treat diseases like psoriasis. So, um, and then the other thing that we think interferons are doing is actually priming for photosensitivity. Um, and in these experiments here, what I mean by photosensitivity is an increased rate of cell death after UV exposure. So this is data we published a few years ago, where if we took lupus keratinocytes and exposed them to UV, um, you can get increased tunnel staining, um, uh, which marks uh, these nicked ends of the DNA, suggesting the cell is undergoing a death, uh, a cell death. Um, and so compared to healthy controls, lupus cells, um, lupus keratinocytes have an increased uh, tunnel staining. Um, if we generate keratinocyte lines that overexpress interferon kappa, we can replicate this phenotype almost exactly where you enhance um, the tunnel staining after UV just by overexpression and the data from these cells was that we were overexpressing about how we saw in lupus, which is about a twofold overexpression of interferon. We've never been able to generate a cell line that expresses more than that because I think the cells just die. Um, and, uh, and then looking at um, primary uh, uh, cells, so again, comparing lupus versus healthy control, if we incubate them with baricitinib, which again blocks type one and signaling by inhibiting JAK1, um, you can again lower the rate of cell death um, uh, after UV exposure. And, and you basically turn the lupus cells almost back to normal. Um, and I, I, and um, this data has actually been the, the preliminary data that got us a um, clinical ACE uh, autoimmune center, center of excellence sponsored clinical trial, which I have been working on designing uh, with um, an AID for the last year and a half. Um, but we are almost ready to start recruiting where we will be treating patients uh, with tofacitinib for four weeks, and we'll be doing photo testing before and after um, the four-week uh, trial of tofacitinib to look at whether we can replicate this finding in vivo, where we see less cell death, possibly a change in minimal erythema dose um, with the use of a JAK inhibitor. Um, we picked tofa at the time because when I wrote the trial, it was the only one that was FDA approved, so that's the one that we're, we're using in the study. So stay tuned uh, for that. Um, and one of my grad students in the lab is um, is uh, really um, uh, uh, focused on trying to understand what are the cell death pathways that are um, uh, primed for by type one interferons. And um, what what Shannon uh, has found is that if we treat with type one interferons before UV exposure, we increase the rate of cell death as we saw before. And when she sorts out necroptotic versus apoptotic um, pathways, she um, she actually can uh, uh, see that um, the necroptotic pathways, which are permeable to pr propidium iodide, um, actually don't increase. But what we see is this increase in the apoptotic. Uh, keratinocyte population, suggesting that it's more of an apoptosis effect of the type 1 interferon priming. Um, and so she's also shown that we can shift the dose response required to induce cell death um, in keratinocytes. So here, UV uh, without interferon priming at 20 millijoules per centimeter squared doesn't increase apoptosis, but if we treat with um, uh, interferon, we can start to see an increase in cell death with only 20 millijoules per centimeter squared, which is about a 10 to 15 minute sun exposure in Michigan equivalent. So uh, like what we see in lupus patients where they are, they are more sensitive to the sun, they can't tolerate the sun for um, the same period of time as, as healthy. That was the last lab meeting I was going to in the young lab. All right, going to. So, um, uh, so we think that the interferons are also priming for dose response shift. And then, um, uh, she's been doing some more detailed studies looking at these apoptotic pathways. And so she's been looking at the presence of um, cleave caspase 3, which if this is an apoptotic phenotype, we should expect cleave caspase, uh, caspase 3 to be cleaved and activated. Um, and, and that is in fact what she has found. So um, if you look at um, the presence of cleave caspase 3 with UV, you do see some turned on. And with interferon priming, we get about a doubling of the cleave caspase 3 that's there, suggesting again that the interferon is really regulating these apoptotic um, pathways and keratinocytes. 
Um, and she has done uh, additional um, work just using inhibitors of some of these other pathways, including RIP, RIP1, um, RIP kinase 1 and RIP kinase 3, which are uh, involved in the necroptotic pathways. And we find that uh, these inhibitors do not change the rate of um, either an XN5 positive propidium iodide negative cells or the cleave caspase 3 um, induction. Um, and we also looked at pyroptosis. Um, Christian mentioned I used to do a lot of work in the inflammasome, and I was really hoping that caspase 1 would be involved in this interferon priming because we know that IRF1, which is a critical transcription factor of caspase 1, um, is upregulated by uh, type 1 interferon exposure. Um, and so I thought, well, that would be so great if caspase 1 is um, one of the things regulating this increased propensity for cell death. But that actually is not the case. Um, the use of YVAD doesn't change the interferon um, promoted uh, enhanced uh, cell death. Um, so we really think this is an apoptotic uh, phenotype. Um, and when we use ZVAD, which is a pan uh, caspase inhibitor, we shut down the apoptosis quite nicely. Um, and I didn't include the work here, but Shannon's gone through and she's looked at caspase 8 and caspase 9 inhibitors. And we do see um, this is a caspase 8 uh, dependent pathway. And so right now we're trying to figure out what the actual uh, mediators are. So we've been looking at different um, uh, proteins, including um, TRAIL, which is upregulated by interferons, and also XAF1, uh, which is an inhibitor of XAAP, which is an inhibitor of caspase 8. So if you inhibit the inhibitor, um, you can induce apoptosis as well. And so um, XAF1 is also turned on by type 1 interferons. Um, and Shannon has been uh, doing a lot of troubleshooting the last couple of months, but we hope to be close to an official answer on the pathways involved um, very soon. Um, so there's a model, I think, of, of, of how we think you know, lupus uh, uh, non-lesional lupus skin is abnormal. We think that there's this chronic um, propensity for interferon production and, and chronic uh, overproduction of interferon kappa. And this primes for um, you know, increased uh, injury after UV. Um, we know that the UV is able to modify DNA and make it more prone to activating sting. And then this upregulates even more interferon. Um, we recruit in myeloid cells and dendritic cells into the skin and neutrophils as well. And these um, can be modified by interferons to be more activated. Um, we also know that this interferon has some, some mechanism to repress the Treg induction. And we're working on trying to sort out what that mechanism might be. Um, and we get more T cell activation uh, after uh, UV exposure um, that is dependent on type 1 interferons as well. Um, these T cells, you, know, you can have CD8 T cells, which are making cytotoxic mediators, um, further inducing more epithelial injury and perpetuating this cycle. And we, we know that the T cells can also go and um, help uh, B cells and uh, induce our autoreactive B cells to uh, generate more autoantibodies, which we know deposit in the dermal epidermal junction. Um, and this could possibly also contribute to epithelial injury, um, further perpetuating the cycle. So, so this is sort of the model of, of what we think happens in non-lesional skin with um, UV exposure. Um, so I'm going to show you some new data, which we're um, hopefully going to submit the paper here in the next few weeks, um, about other pathways that could possibly be contributing um, to a predisposition in lupus skin. And one of the questions I've had um, floating around in my brain for a while is ever since Jasmine Standard had published her paper um, in our group um, back in 2017, one of the things we noticed was that the abnormalities that we saw in lupus keratinocytes were perpetuated in culture. So we could passage these cells up to passage five before they you know, poop out, basically. The primary keratinocytes don't last forever. Um, but if we looked at passage three, passage four, and passage five, we saw the same skewing of IL-6 production um, which we knew was dependent on type 1 interferon cycling, but we could see this same like hyperinflammatory response throughout the culture. So this suggested to me that there could be an epi um, epigenetic reason for this um, because we see this persistent culture. So it's not just some exposure in the skin that changes the cell and then the longer you culture them. And, you know, passage five here takes, takes up to probably about six weeks to get to that point because when we isolate the cells, it takes about two weeks to get to our passage zero, which is when we put them onto a 10 centimeter dish. So, um, so really it's not a drug effect anymore because that's been washed out um, over time. Um, and so uh, one of the studies that we did in collaboration with Amr Sawala, um, who was at Michigan at the time, 
um, was to do a Illumina um, methylation array to see whether there was any differentially methylated regions in lupus keratinocytes versus healthy controls. So this is data from eight uh, non-lesional lupus biopsies, um, and we had eight controls, which we matched for um, age within six years and also sex and ethnicity. And then um, uh, did the array, and you can see that there actually uh, were quite a few differentially methylated CPG sites in uh, lupus, both hypomethylated and hypermethylated. And when we looked at the pathways that were um, most highly involved uh, by these methylation changes, what came out on top was actually hippo signaling. And I was like, what the heck is hippo signaling? I've never heard of this. But it turns out hippo signaling is actually kind of interesting. So it's been uh, studied in, in cancer primarily. Um, and really the, the interest in hippo signaling is escalating. So it's got one of those you know, uh, exponential curves when you look at PubMed citations. Um, and uh, really hippo signaling is interesting because it seems to be a critical regulator of um, cell death. And uh, so I've sketched out here how hippo signaling works. And um, uh, basically the main switch is this adapter molecule called WWC1. And so if WWC1 uh, is uh, present and you can sort of modulate the signaling of this pathway by the more WWC1 versus the less. But if you have WWC1 uh, available, it binds MOB1, which phosphorylates a protein called LATS. It's a LATS is a kinase, uh, either LATS1 or LATS2. And when LATS1 or 2 is activated through phosphorylation, it is then able to phosphorylate a transcriptional co-activator called YAP. And uh, there's also one called TAS, which is sort of interchangeable with YAP, but I'm going to focus on YAP to keep it simple. So when YAP gets phosphorylated, it is retained in the cytosol and it cannot bind TED. And there's several different TEDs, but again, to keep it simple, uh, we'll just call it TED. And um, so when YAP is phosphorylated, it's retained in the cytoplasm and cannot bind TED. When YAP is not phosphorylated, it is allowed to go to the nucleus and it binds TED and uh, upregulates a cell proliferative um, transcriptional program. And so when YAP and TED are together, the cell likes to grow. When YAP and TED are not together, you actually get more apoptosis. And so um, when we looked at our methylation data, one of the things that was interesting was that WWC1 is hypomethylated in the lupus keratinocytes, suggesting that its expression should be increased. And if there's increased WWC1, we would expect more phosphorylated YAP in the cytoplasm and uh, possibly an apoptotic profile to these keratinocytes. So when we look um, at WWC1 in uh, healthy control versus lupus, we actually see that WWC1 does seem to be overexpressed in lupus keratinocytes versus healthy control. So we've now looked at six different lupus lines versus five different control lines, and we do see a significant increase in WWC1 expression. Um, we think there's also some chronic increase in phospho -YAP um, although I found out uh, recently that the way that this ratio was calculated is not how I would have done it. So I'm having my, uh, my um, mentee, Grace Heil, who's doing a lot of this work, uh, redo um, these phospho-westerns and redo the ratios. But um, there does seem to be a trend for increased phospho yep. And so we wanted to see whether we could see any evidence of this hippo signaling pathway being skewed in um, lupus keratinocytes. So again, um, we used the genes that are known to be turned on when, when YAP and um, TED are together and inducing the proliferation profile of uh, activated hippo signaling. And we created a score like we do for interferon spores of the hippo genes and then looked in our um, lesional uh, lupus biopsies to see whether there was any difference in the, um, in the scoring. And what we could see is that in both the discoid and in the SCLE, lesions, we could see a downregulation of this hippo uh, signaling, suggesting that this may be a functional uh, relevant change in vivo. Um, and so uh, we had a, a question of whether the, um, uh, because we know that when uh, YAP is phosphorylated, you have more propensity for apoptosis, we wanted to see whether we could see effects of UV be amplified uh, if we could interrupt YAP and TED from interacting. And so we got a um, great cell line from uh, Dr. Ramiro Iglesias Bartolome at the NIH, um, who has been studying uh, uh, 
T signaling, and he had generated a NTERT keratinocyte cell line, which was perfect for us because we use NTERTs as sort of our um, cell line to do my, uh, molecular biology and keratinocytes. So he had generated a um, doxycycline inducible inhibitor that uh, binds um, between the site where uh, YAP can interact with T. And so when you turn on this inhibitor, you then um, basically block the um, transcriptional program of um, YAPTEED. And so uh, when we um, turned on this TEED inhibitor in the NTERTs, we could see that we could get increased um, tunnel staining in these keratinocytes. And if we uv them, uh, you can see some mild increase in tunnel staining in the control NTERTs. But in the TEED overexpressors, we actually got a much a higher percent of tunnel positivity um, in the keratinocytes, suggesting that this pathway could be relevant for regulating UV-mediated apoptosis. Um, we then used uh, a caspase 37 activation assay, um, which uh, basically um, when caspase 3 is activated, it cleaves this fluorescently tagged um, uh, uh, substrate and locks it into the active caspase and you can stain or detect it on microscopy. And um, what Grace showed here was that um, with UV, we can see some uh, cleaved caspase 3 um, or caspase 3 activity. Um, with the TEED inhibitor itself, again, we get sort of a mild upregulation of apoptosis, but with UV, we see a lot of cleaved caspase 3 in these cell lines. Again, suggesting that um, the, the HIPPO pathway is a, is a relevant regulator of this cell death um, signaling. So then we looked at, um, uh, we have uh, eight different lupus keratinocyte lines and eight healthy control lines that we have treated with 50 millijoules per UV and just done RNA sequencing to look at the transcriptional changes that are happening after UV. Um, and um, what we could also see is that in the lupus versus healthy control, when you give them this dose of UV, you have repression of the um, genes that are known to be turned on by YAP and TEED um, transcription, suggesting again, after UV in the lupus cells, you get a repression of the TEED signaling, um, whereas in control cells, you still maintain some of this, this signaling present. I mean, in the, um, in the lupus, you also have upregulation of these pro-apoptotic genes, which when T doesn't have YAP, uh, tends to turn on. So again, you see this, this toggling um, uh, of these hippo genes from a proliferative to an apoptotic response to a much greater effect in the lupus versus the healthy control of keratinocytes. So we think uh, the model here is that in lupus, um, there's increased expression of WWC1, which basically tips the scale towards last activation and phosphorylation of YAP and retention of YAP in the cytoplasm, which then uh, upon further triggering of, of cellular stress, basically tips the cell towards an apoptotic um, phenotype. Um, and so we're, we're working on wrapping up a few little pieces of data, um, including in vivo validation with a new um, inhibitor of last kinase that just came out. It's called Truly. The paper's still on BioArchive that describes it. But it seems to be a pretty specific inhibitor of last kinase. So we're trying this in our in our primary lupus lines to see if we can modulate cell death there, because um, I think this could be potentially a pretty interesting activator of uh, or um, a drug that could be adapted to to consider in in lupus. Um, so we are uh, in the process of um, doing those studies right now and hopefully getting this paper out for review. Um, so to summarize, uh, the skin is an active player in innate immune responses. And we, we really think that the normal skin of lupus patients, um, it's interferon rich, it's primed to signal to um, other stromal and inflammatory cell populations. And we think that these, these, the skewed change um, contributes to photosensitivity, especially the type 1 interferons, and also immune cell activation, repression of Treg uh, uh, responses. And we think that there are some direct links to systemic immune activation, um, but this requires more research and Keith is obviously leading the way um, in some of that work. Um, we think that HIPPO signaling is a potential uh, new novel pathway that could uh, be used to target photosensitive responses in lupus skin. Um, and uh, further research into photosensitivity and uh, the mechanisms driving it and also the critical cell-cell interactions that you know, lead to, to rash development um, are really needed so that we can, one, prevent the, the skin from overreacting in the first place, and hopefully that will prevent disease flares um, down the road. So with that, I would just like to thank um, collaborators and people who've helped with the work that I've shown. Everybody in bold is people who, um, who have actively participated in the data from our group that I showed you.
um, especially uh, uh, Ramiro Iglesias Bartolome for giving us that T inhibitor cell line and Amr Sawala for assisting with the um, methylation work. Um, and then uh, Johan and Alex, um, we basically collaborate with them on everything that we do. Um, they're uh, great partners in, in, in the studies that we have ongoing. Um, I'd like to thank our funding sources and all of the patients who've given us skin biopsies to facilitate our work. Um, here's my Twitter handle if you want to follow me on Twitter. Um, and with that, I can take questions. This was wonderful, Michelle, thank you. Um, while waiting up on the Q&A, let me have a quick question for you as well. Two questions as opposed based on your novel research on the HIPAA pathway. Uh, do you think this is specific for keratinocytes or do you see that pathway also in more systemically in these patients? And, and also what, what do you think is regulating that pathway? Is it also interfering driven or anything like that? Uh, it's a very interesting uh, questions, Christian. So, um... It could be, so certainly the HIPPO pathway has been studied in other um, cancer cell lines. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, certainly, you know, there's been some data in like melanoma um, suggesting that melanocytes also have, you know, aberrancies in this pathway. So it could very well be part of that, um, you know, in other, other cell populations. Um, it's possible that interferons could be regulating this. I think we don't understand what what is the epigenetic reason for it to be hypomethylated? The interesting thing is that lupus keratinocytes don't look like lupus immune cells in terms of their methylation pattern. So Amr and you know, others have previously published that the interferon signature is hypomethylated in T cells, for example, in lupus patients. And so you're primed for an interferon response in, in the immune system by these methylation changes. But in the epidermis, one of the things that surprised us was that the interferon genes are not differentially methylated in lupus versus healthy control. And so um, at first we were like, oh man, this is all useless data. And then, you know, we started like studying the analysis a little bit more and we were like hippo signaling. I don't know what that is. So it turns out that, you know, it could be interesting. So, um, so we don't know why the hippo pathway is differentially regulated. One of my questions that we're trying to get funding for right now is to repeat this in our mm -hmm. UV stimulated patients to see mm -hmm. whether UV actually could be marking this pathway for being turned on. Um, and so maybe there's some, you know, dysfunction there in, in lupus skin where they, they tend to hypomethylate this pathway differently. So, you know, again, um, more biology that I need to read up on in terms of like what would be the specific um, methyl transferases, et cetera. Um, so I think that's a good question. The other thing is that we know there's some data that uh, YAP, when it's phosphorylated, mm -hmm. um, is able to interact with tank binding kinase one, which is downstream of sting. And so there's been some data to suggest that phospho YAP may be a switch for how activated the interferon response is. And this is something that we're also testing to see whether um, we can uh, use these last kinase inhibitors to modulate how sting is able to turn on interferons in keratinocytes. So, cool. um, you know, there's some cool links there between this pathway and, and how we think interferons are regulated. So, um, yeah, so to be continued. Um, and then uh, to Mark, Professor Mark Wenner's point here, I suppose, he's also asking about HIPPO in other chronic dermatology conditions. So like the psoriasis, and of course, I'm also thinking about JDM and so forth. Have you looked into any of that? We, we haven't yet. So this, this is a relatively new story for us um, that has been developing over the last six months or so. Um, so obviously, we've got data in a lot of other um, uh, cell or um, inflammatory skin diseases. So we could look. We just haven't yet. Um, my bioinformaticists are uh, overwhelmed. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think it's a really good question. Um, and whether this is a common pathway or something unique to lupus, I think we don't know yet. Excellent. And I don't know, Michelle, if you wanted to have a look at the cute questions. Yeah, here. I'll just go from the top. Um, so uh, uh, Tomas asked about transcriptional regulation of interferon kappa. We are working on it. We almost have a paper ready. Um, I'm not going to spill any beans, but um, there is differential regulation of kappa compared to beta. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, we think we know some of the players, probably not all, um, but there is there is a different. They definitely are regulated differently. So we'll we'll leave it at that. 
Um, how selective is the, so Keith wants to know how selective is the hippo pathway difference in lupus for UV? In other words, do you see differences in apoptosis in response to other? I'm guessing it's probably broader than just UV. Um, so so um, Dr. Iglesias Bartolome, who gave us the inhibitor, they had, they had looked at it in, uh, um, I think it was chemotherapy induced apoptosis and they could show that that also was a, a, a method. Um, and we do see increased apoptosis at baseline when we turn on that inhibitor. So I think it's there and um, it may not be specific to UV, but if the pathway is abnormally skewed and then you put a, a, a apoptotic stimulator on it, um, it could be a reason why the cells die more. So it may not be specific, but, um, but possibly relevant. Um, so Sarah Chung asks, is there anything you found that might account for the distinctive clinical presentation of discoid in terms of scarring and fibrosis? Excellent question. We are also actively doing this project. Um, so we, we have a lot of data now between patients who scar and patients who don't. And so we are working on trying to understand the transcriptional signatures um, that are different between those patients. Um, and we actually have fibroblasts from all of those patients. So we are working on doing some functional follow-up studies in the patients who scar versus don't to, to understand whether those transcriptional differences are relevant. So uh, to be continued, but excellent question. Um, and then Grant Hughes said, what might be driving maintaining epigenetic changes in non-lesional keratinocytes? Um, so kappa, interestingly, is not epigenetically different in lupus versus control. And that was the whole reason we started. We actually did bisulfite sequencing of just the kappa promoter in our original work because I thought for sure it was going to be hypomethylated based on AMRS data, you know, about hypomethylation and other lupus cells. And um, it turns out it's totally not. It's the same. And, you know, it's, it, I was really bummed because also there's been data to show that cutaneous viral infections can um, hypermethylate the kappa promoter and turn it off because it's part of the antiviral response. And so um, I thought for sure we were going to see differences in methylation, but we didn't. Um, so, so it's not the kappa that, or the methylation of the kappa that seems to be regulating it. Now, maybe, you know, there's acetylation changes or open chromatin issues that we haven't looked at yet, but, um, but yeah, so, so that isn't different. Um, and we don't know what the drivers are yet, but we are writing for funding to look, so we'll see. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so we looked at DNA and RNA sensors. Um, can you be more specific? Yes. Uh, in terms of like just their expression, they're definitely skewed. Rig I especially is skewed in, um, in uh, lupus. Um, and we actually just published an interesting paper on a patient of uh, mine that has um, singleton Merton, which is a mutation in Rig I where they have chronic interferon induction. And these patients get glaucoma and sort of strange rashes that don't fit into a real subcategory. And um, when you looked at the, the skin, actually, the, the interferon signatures were high in the patient, um, but not peripherally. And um, I, we put that patient on um, uh, uh, Rinvoc. I'm not supposed to say that name. Uh, um, I'm blanking on the uh, generic name. Uh, it's the U. Anyway, it's a JAK inhibitor. So we put that patient on a JAK inhibitor. And um, actually, the skin got better. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so that one's out. It's in a in a, a genetics journal, but um, kind of a cool story there. Oh, Upa Desetnip, thank you, Catherine. <laughs> I have to take my room board research this year. It's kind of scary, isn't it? Um, and then, uh, do you find evidence for natosis in lupus or following UV? So the excellent question. Um, so there is data from Mariana Kaplan's group. Um, gosh, almost ten years old now. That um, you could see. Uh, nets in the skin of CLE. Um, it's hard to do by microscopy because you basically have to try to show co-staining of these, you know, um, enzymes on, on DNA extracellularly in a three-dimensional tissue. So it's kind of tough. Um, but there was a paper, I think came out last year where somebody had looked at the different subtypes of cutaneous lupus and tried to do micro microscopic quantitation of nets. And they showed that certain subtypes um, had more nets than others. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, you never capture the neutrophils in the skin lesions themselves, right? So, 
So the way I think about the neutrophil is it may be, you know, starting the party and then it goes home. So, so you might see it early, especially with, with case data after UV that you get um, really uh, early infiltration into the skin of these neutrophils after UV and they may net and the ones that don't net survive to go to the kidney and cause uh, trouble there. But, um, but pro in like the, the VISTA knockout mouse model also suggests that neutrophils are in the non-lesional skin. Um, we've done single cell or, uh, seek of non-lesional skin, but neutrophils are really hard to capture on single cell because they just die before they get through the whole process. So we haven't seen a population there yet, um, but we are starting to do some spatial seek and other, other types of um, analysis that so we may be able to capture them a little better that way. Um, but yeah, and then I just saw somebody, uh, we just written a review. I don't know if anybody here was our reviewer, but some very helpful comments in, of our paper. And um, what they just pointed me to a, a recent paper where they showed that neutrophil nets actually stimulate sea gas. And so like that would make a lot of sense if, if they were netting in the skin as part of the UV response. And we know that in culture, UV stimulates neutrophils to net. So there's lots of pieces of the puzzle there that, that would make sense if you put it all together. One final question from the chat uh, from Professor Mark Wenner again. Are there known genetic polymorphisms in HIPPO pathway genes? Linked to lupus pathogenesis? It, it doesn't uh, say. I would assume there would be to malignancy, but maybe not to lupus. Yeah, I am not sure about that. I would have to read more and let you know. Sorry. This is fine. I think that was all the questions. Thank you so much, Michelle. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Collenberg. And again, this will be posted, um, recorded and posted on our website this week. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.